Yes, yeah, so I'm Sam. I'm from Monash University. I work as a biostatistician there uh, in the School of Public Health and Preventive Medicine. Um, so a bit of an outline of the talk that I'll be giving today. So I'll give a bit of background to survival analysis. I'll describe a general method that we can use to simulate event times or survival times, um, and then go through a few quick examples showing how we can use this new SimServe package to uh, simulate event times under a variety of data generating models. Okay, so uh, what is survival analysis? Well, we're talking about a variable um, that corresponds to the time from some defined baseline, so it might be something like diagnosis of a disease, until the occurrence of an event of interest. So if diagnosis of a disease was our baseline, then something like um, time to heart failure might be our event. Uh, so here, uh, I've used heart failure to kind of denote the fact that although we mention this as survival analysis, it doesn't have to be death that we're interested in. So it's used in a bunch of disciplines and known by different terminology in all of those. Um, so each of these, uh, the methodology, uh, methodology underpinning the analysis is always uh, generally going to be the same. Um, and the context for this talk, because of the area I work in, will be health research. So uh, usually in that setting, we're talking about an observational unit being an individual. Uh, so for example, we'll be measuring an event time on each patient. So. So before uh, we get into modeling or simulating survival data, why might we want to do this? Uh, so the most obvious reason is that we might want to evaluate uh, the performance of either new or existing statistical methods. Uh, so that's usually the primary reason, but there's other reasons. So for example, uh, we might want to calculate statistical power, for example, in clinical trials with a complex design, say. Or we might want to calculate some kind of uncertainty in model prediction. So uh, one example might be if we wanted transition probabilities for multi-state models, for example, uh, and potentially others that I haven't mentioned here. Okay, so before we think about how we might want to simulate survival data, we probably need to talk about how we usually analyze it, because in most cases uh, we want our simulation model to line up with our analysis model. Uh, that's not always the case, but it's the most common case. Um, so here we're just going to let TI star denote the true event time for individual I, and I use quotes here for true um, event time because in practice uh, we might not actually observe this event time due to what we call right censoring. So for example, the study might end uh, before we actually see the event occur for some individual. Uh, so that's relevant to the analysis of survival data, but not so relevant uh, to the simulation that we're going to be talking about here. Okay, so it's possible to model the event time directly, so TI star and accelerated failure times are, are models, or AFT models are an example of this. Um, but it's actually more common to model the rate of the occurrence of the event. Uh, so for example, the famous Cox proportional hazards model is an example of where we model the rate of the event rather than the time to event directly. Uh, so we can define what we call the hazard at time t as being the instantaneous rate of occurrence of the event. And we have this formula here uh, where we have the probability, where we assume the individual's alive at the current time still, or still at risk. And we have the probability of the event occurring in some uh, future small interval, delta t. And then we take that probability um, as a rate, but as the uh, size of that interval, so delta t shrinks to zero or approaches the limit at zero. So that defines the hazard, which is our instantaneous rate of the event. And then there's some other quantities which are of interest to us in survival analysis that, he, that can be quite useful here. Uh, so one of these is the cumulative hazard. So we can take the integral from baseline, say time zero, up until the current time and add up all the little bits of hazard up until that point. And we have what's called the cumulative hazard. And then the other quantity we're often interested in is the survival probability. So what is the probability that the individual's true event time is greater than the current time t? And there's a one-to-one -one relationship here uh, in this setting uh, where our survival probability has a one-to-one -one relationship with the cumulative uh, hazard, with the formula given there. So what's going to be useful here is that we can uh, recognize that this definition of the survival probability is the complement of the CDF for the distribution of the event times, so the cumulative distribution function for the event times. 
And why that's useful is because uh, a bit of basic probability theory tells us that uh, if we've got some continuous random variable x, so here it's going to be our event times, our uh, distribution of uh, randomly drawn event times, and we apply the CDF to that, uh, we get some uniform random variable on the range 0 to 1. And similarly, if we take the complement of the CDF uh, of x, we also get a uniform random variable on the range 0 to 1. So the reason this is useful is because we can say, OK, for some simulated event time, here TIS, uh, we can work out the survival probability at that point, and we know that it's going to be equal to this random variable ui, which is just a uniform random variable on the range 0 to 1. And so if we know that, we can just rearrange, and we can solve for our simulated event time, and then uh, we've got this uh, straightforward and easy to implement formula. So this is commonly known as the cumulative hazard inversion method, and it's used quite regularly. Uh, and it's easy, it's efficient, it's fast uh, when we have an analy analytical expression for the cumulative hazard, and we're able to uh, invert that. But for slightly more complex specifications of the hazard, uh, we can run into two problems. So first, our cumulative hazard might not have a closed form expression. And second, we might not be able to invert it even if it does. Um, so two obvious kind of solutions for this. Uh, the first is numerical integration. So we can just use quadrature to numerically calculate the cumulative hazard. And uh, for the second one, we can use some kind of iterative root finding, some univariate root finding technique to numerically invert. So uh, in a paper a few years ago, Michael Crowder and Paul Lambert uh, put these ideas together uh, and described this kind of general algorithm. Uh, so we have in the top left here, does HIT, the cumulative hazard, have a closed form expression? If it does, can we solve for T uh, the event time analytically? And if we can, we can just apply that formula from the previous page. Uh, in the far left or the bottom left box, if we can't even get a closed form for the cumulative hazard, then we have the situation in which we use numerical integration, but we can uh, nest that numerical integration inside each iteration of our univariate root finder. So we go back and forth between the integration, numerical integration and the root finding steps uh, until we find a solution with some tolerance for the event time. So this idea was implemented in a Stata package a couple of years ago and uh, now it's in R as part of the SimServe package. So the, the package is up on CRAN and it's built around one function, so uh, very basic sort of package structure. But with that one function, or that one exported function, uh, we can actually simulate event times under a whole range of survival models based on hazard specifications. So those are some examples there of the types of models we can consider. And we want to use analytical forms wherever we can, but where we can't, we use Gauss-Cromrod quadrature. Um, and uh, for the iterative root finding, just Brent's univariate root finder, so the uni root function in R. OK, so I'm just going to talk through a few of the examples um, briefly, uh, covering these ones here. OK, so uh, we can start with the most basic case, so just a standard parametric proportional hazards model. Uh, so the way I'm going to present this is on the left, we have plots of the hazard function um, under each of these models that we're going to simulate under. And on the right, we have at the top a general definition of the model, and then below that, a sort of example specification of each of the models and parameters and true parameters and covariates we'll use. OK, so under this, we'll just for simplicity assume a Weibull distribution for the baseline hazard. And then we just have one covariate here, which is a binary covariate, uh, which can represent uh, treatment. And then we have some protective effect of treatment, so a log hazard ratio that's negative. Uh, and we can see that in the plot. So the blue line, the control group, has some hazard function that's increasing monotonically over time. And then uh, the treatment group, represented by the red line, uh, has a lower hazard rate, so a protective effect of the treatment. 
and we can look at how we can simulate this using SimServe. So we just define some dimensions, the number of patients. Uh, we then define a data frame uh, with the covariate. So here we just have a subject ID and a treatment indicator. We then have a named vector for the true uh, regression coefficients, in this case just the single log hazard ratio. Uh, and then we just call SimServe. We have to specify these lambdas and gammas, which are scale and shape uh, parameters for the wireball distribution, so the baseline hazard. And then we just pass in the regression coefficients and the covariates. But this wireball distribution can be limiting. So uh, we can see that in the previous example, the baseline hazard's monotonically increasing, and that's a constraint uh, that the wireball has. It has to be monotonically increasing or decreasing. So a more realistic example, um, here might be represented by a hazard function that peaks early on. Uh, so for example, after surgery perhaps, we might have high rates of death or some uh, adverse event in the first week after surgery and then a, a reduction in the rate of those events and then sort of long-term slow, slower increase. And so in SimServe, uh, we can uh, easily get simulations under these types of models through these two component mixture distributions. So we're uh, specifying a mixture of wireballs on the survival scale with some mixing parameter P. And so I won't go through the details of the model, but to look at the code and how we could do this as an extension of the previous example, uh, our covariates and our regression coefficients are all specified in the same way. But what we have now in this call to some serve is we specify mixture equals true and the true value P mix of the mixing parameter which in this case is 0.2. And then now we have two lambdas and two gammas for the two component Weibull distributions. Okay, another common example would be non-proportional hazards. Uh, so here also known as time-dependent effects or time-dependent hazard ratios. Uh, so we can consider a model where our baseline hazard is the same as the first example for the control group. But now we have this protective effect of treatment early on. So the hazard for the treatment group is less in the early uh, time frames. And then by about three and a half years, there's a crossing over and we see uh, what appears to be a detrimental effect of treatment in later weeks or later years. So we can think about how we could simulate it using SimServe. So the only addition here is that we have, um, sorry if I go back, we have an interaction with, between the regression coefficient and uh, some function of time in the top, uh, and so here we're going to specify an interaction in this example with log time. So we just have, have to specify the true value of that regression coefficient, so we've passed that into this name vector pars underscore TDE. And then we just pass that in through the TDE argument of SimServe, and then we also specify this TDE fun argument to say that we want to uh, specify this as an interaction between that regression coefficient and log time rather than just linear time. Okay, and the last example here is uh, clustered survival time. So these um, commonly appear in what's known as shared frailty models or potentially in meta-analysis type models. Um, so the example we'll consider here is where we've got a meta-analysis of different clinical trials. And once again, we just have a treatment indicator for each patient in each of those trials. Uh, and what we're going to specify is these BJs in the second, second formula. And these BJs are going to be uh, study-specific deviations in the treatment effect. So how does the, each study's treatment effect differ from the overall uh, population average treatment effect, say? And so there's a distribution for these so-called random effects or these study-specific deviations. And we're going to assume a normal distribution here. And we can look at how we'd specify that using SimServe. So all the changes is our covariates now have a study ID. So each patient has a, a ID for the study they belong to. And then in the defining the true parameters, we have our population level of, uh, log hazard ratio. So the negative 0.5 we had in the previous examples. But now we add on this uh, random effect or the study specific deviation in the treatment effect. So here our true parameters, in the previous examples they were a, a named vector, here they're a data frame, so each row of the data frame 
is going to correspond to the true regression coefficients just for one of the individuals. So our SimServe call is exactly the same as the first example, but now because our uh, true regression coefficients are a data frame, we get these clustered survival times. Okay, so just to summarize, uh, the SimServe package implements a method that only requires us to specify the hazard function for the data generating model and simulating these event times, which gives us a lot more flexibility. And I showed a few examples uh, of more common scenarios where we can simulate using these kind of convenience arguments in the SimServe call. But what I didn't describe is we can actually uh, pass in user-defined hazard functions. So uh, the user has even more flexibility beyond what they can do with these kind of default arguments or these user-specified arguments. They can provide their own hazard function as an R function. And it means we can do even more complex things like time-varying covariates, joint models, for longitudinal and survival data, data, or flexible parametric models like Royston-Palmer type models. Uh, and in terms of computation, like, things seem relatively fast, but I guess it depends what the definition of uh, fast really is. So here, 10,000 simulated event times is fast with analytical forms for everything, uh, less than a second, but slightly slower, so around 10 seconds if we have to do the quadrature and the iterative root finding. Um, but as part of future work, one of the extensions would be looking to vectorize the uni root function in R um, and potentially implement that in C++, which would uh, mean massive speed gains um, in terms of the, the root finding parts. Okay, and that's it. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, so you, as long as you can define it as an R function and the arguments to that R function are simply just uh, time, so time is, is specified as part of the process, but you just pass in your covariates and your true parameter values. So as long as you can define an R function that can return the hazard at the time t, then uh, the rest can kind of just be implemented by the package. So. Yeah, so you just need to pass in a user to find hazard function and it could easily be some kind of uh, finite mixture. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so at the moment I've just implemented um, a fix. So there's an argument max t where you specify a time and people are censored if they uh, survive, if their event time is greater than that fixed time. Um, in the future, maybe I'll uh, allow for you to pass in an R function, so you, know, you could have a uniform distribution of censoring times or something. If you have a complex scenario, so those would all be like non-informative censoring. If you have a more complex scenario where you want informative censoring, uh, then you could just use some serve to simulate uh, censoring times based on whatever covariates uh, you want to inform that censoring time, and you could use some serve to simulate the event time and you just take the minimum of those two processes. So yeah, so that would work. Yeah, so uh, in terms of competing risks, it's, it's not quite that easy because we would want to use cause-specific hazards, so I'm planning to add that in pretty soon. And then you'd, one approach is you use a multinomial distribution based on the cause-specific hazards to determine which event type it is. But if you just have a single informative censoring distribution, then just uh, simulating the two, the, the censoring time and the event time, and taking the minimum should work. 